Well, good morning, children. Um, do you like my brown piece of cardboard? Well, it's brown. It's a brown piece of cardboard, thank you very much. Well, I'm not sure why everyone's disagreeing with me. Why are you all looking at me like I'm crazy? It's a brown piece of cardboard. No, 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 I, I guarantee you it is a brown piece of cardboard. Oh, it is a red piece of cardboard. Look at that. What color is it? No, no, it's just red. No, it's red. See, what's the problem right now? We're looking at a different piece of cardboard, aren't we? And it's two-sided. And so depending on which side you look at is going to change what the color is from your perspective. So we talk about a person's perspective, which is a fancy way of saying the way you see things. And today in the Bible time, when we open up the Bible later on, we're going to be looking at a part of the Bible in Isaiah. And what we're going to be looking at is when Isaiah saw God. And what he quickly realized when he saw God, when he gained a new perspective, when he looked at things from a different way, was that he was actually a lot more sinful than what he thought. You see, often in our lives, we can spend all of our time looking at other people. So we can find the worst baddies we can find. We can find the people that go to jail, those types of people. We look at them and we go, well... I'm actually pretty good because I don't kill people. I'm pretty good because I don't go around and steal people's cars and things like that. But, but when we stop looking at other people and we start looking at God, what we realize is we're actually not very good. Compared to God, we're really not very good at all. But the wonderful thing is that even though we're not very good, in fact, there's nothing good in us, God loves us so much that he would make us good. And this is what Isaiah found out. He found out that actually deep down he was really, really sinful. But then he found out that his God was so loving that he would make him good, that he would make him right and clean. And that's true for you guys too. Depending on how you look at the piece of cardboard will change the way you understand the piece of cardboard. Depending upon how you look at yourself will change how you think about yourself. And what God wants is for us to be really honest about who we are because then we can come to him and say, God, you know, I've, I'm actually really bad. I've got nothing good in me to offer you. I've got nothing good to give you, but I know that you love me and will give me everything I need. And he gives us Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for these children, and I thank you that you love them. I thank you that you love them so much that even though they're not good, you would give your son so that you could make them good. And I pray, Lord, that even now you would be working in their hearts so that they would Embrace everything that their baptisms point to, everything that the Bible points to, and they would be made good in Jesus Christ. Help us to understand, help us as a church to love them and care for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats. Turn with me to the book of uh, Ezekiel. If you're using a church Bible, you'll find it on page 586. Ezekiel chapter 1, this is uh, part of Ezekiel's account of the vision that uh, God gave to him. I'm going to read from verse 4 down to 14 and then from 22 to 28. Hear the word of God. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. 
their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. And at verse 22... Over the heads of the living creatures there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystals spread out above their heads. And under the expanse their wings were stretched out straight one toward another. And each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of the throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord." And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Amen. Oh, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you all again. If you want to open up your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Of course, I wasn't smart enough to do something like look up a page number, so... It's in the Old Testament, if that's helpful. Um, Go past this book of Psalms. Isaiah, we're looking at the vision that Isaiah has of the Lord. Isaiah 6, starting at verse 1. Hear the word of God for you this morning. In the year... That King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two He flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I 
am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So far, the reading of God's word. Let us come before him in prayer. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you this morning for your word. We give thanks to you because you have blessed us so richly with word after word after word of your perfect spoken word. And Lord, we're just reminded of the words of Calvin who said, when we read the Bible, God speaks. And so we thank you that you speak to us this morning. And now, Lord, as we, as we open this up and as, as I speak to human ears, we pray that by your Spirit you would speak to each and every one of our hearts. That none of us would leave empty-hearted, but rather every one of us would leave overflowing with the Word of God deep inside of our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We all love to hate the real sinners, don't we? And what I mean by that is, I don't know, maybe you remember going back to January, it's still on the media, the, the Turpin family, the case in the States of a family who had 13 children taken away for them for the atrocities that they committed upon this poor, poor family. And the media just fed on it. And people, although horrified, loved seeing just the despicableness of these people. You know, we, we love to hate the likes of Adolf Hitler, don't we? We love to see the worst of the worst in society because deep down, it makes us feel better about ourselves because I never do that to my children. I never murder. I never commit that type of action on a woman. I never beat my wife. So I can look at these people and, and feel somehow justified in myself because I'm not quite that bad. In fact, I'm actually pretty good because I love my wife and I love my children and I seek to do what's best and, and I don't hate people, you know, and I try and be kind to people, not like these, these real sinners out there. But as I said to the children, true, true perspective brings with it true understanding, doesn't it? It's not until I flip the cardboard over and see the red that I can say, oh yes, in fact, the other cardboard is red. And as long as we sit and look at real sinners around us, we will constantly think we're pretty good people. And so we're confronted with Isaiah, the great prophet, who for five chapters has been declaring judgment and woe upon Judah and Jerusalem. For five chapters, judgment after judgment, the day of the Lord is coming, the day of reckoning is coming, punishment is coming. And then he went into the temple and was confronted by the living God. 
And all of a sudden, everything was put into perspective. All of a sudden, he had true perspective dropped on his lap, so to say. And he gained true understanding of himself as he stood before God. Because the reality is, what Isaiah found out is that God is so much more holy than he could ever imagine. And that he was so much more sinful than he ever knew. And God's provision is so much richer than he had ever experienced. And that's what I'd like us to see this morning, that there is a holy God, that we are holy, W-H, holy sinners all the way through. And yet a holy God gives us a holy provision. So first and foremost, there is a holy God, brothers and sisters. In the year, verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, being Isaiah, saw the Lord. Now, we allow this to wash over us, I think. We hear, I saw the Lord, and we go, okay, he saw the Lord. But I think because we're not steeped in the sort of teaching that the likes of Isaiah would have been steeped in, we, it doesn't impact us. We don't realize the reality that time and time and time again, the Jews were told in the Old Testament to see the face of God was to die. To see the Lord meant to die. And so throughout the Old Testament, you have all of these stories of people coming into contact with messengers of the Lord, just messengers of the Lord, and falling down in terror. Over and over again. And so when Isaiah says, I saw the Lord, this is a profound thing for any person to have come out of their mouth. He didn't have some special experience like we hear people talking about today. He didn't experience God in some new spiritual way. No, no. No, no, he saw the Lord in his splendor and beauty and incredible perfection. Everything about the Lord, he saw it with his own eyes. And what did he see? He saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. You see, so for five chapters, Isaiah has been saying, judgment is coming from the Lord. Judgment is coming. And then he walks in, and what does he see but the Lord sitting upon a throne of judgment? A throne where where one rules, where one makes decisions, where one casts the judgment decision upon a person. And the Lord is sitting there. But notice that he doesn't say he he was seated there. But he says he is sitting upon a throne. And of course, this harkens back, doesn't it, to Psalm 2. Where the psalmist says that the the nations are raging. You know, they're, they're plotting and they're raging and they're seeking to tear the anointed of God down and the Lord sits enthroned on high and just laughs. It's one of my favorite statements is the Lord sitting there just laughing in derision at the foolishness of men trying to overthrow his plan. And so this is the type of picture that Isaiah sees. He sees the Lord sitting on this majestic throne, all-powerful, almighty. No one can ascend. No one can climb up that throne and say, I'm taking the seat. No one can dare come into that throne of God, for it is His judgment seat. 
But it's not just a throne. It's a throne that is high and lifted up. It's up above everything else. There's, there's no other thrones that are, that are seated higher than it. There's not sort of a gallery with people sitting in it looking down upon him. No, no. He is the high and exalted king. Is, is this not the picture of our Lord? He's high and lifted up. This is, this is why I wanted Ezekiel read. It's the same picture, this just majestic, incredible picture of the Lord enthroned on high. You know, and we look around us at this world which just seems to be going insane. And we see the plots of other religions and the plots of atheists and the plots of heretical Christian groups. And we wonder what's going to happen. I tell you, those wonderings, those doubts vanish for Isaiah. So Isaiah, his king has just died. He's prophesying that judgment will fall upon Judah, that the chosen people of God would be taken to exile to Babylon. He's prophesying that the special people of God would feel the wrath of God. And you can just imagine him as he does that as a prophet. Well, what about this? He would have had so many questions. What's going to happen? What about this promise and what's happening here? And all of it was silenced when he walked into the throne room of God and saw the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords enthroned above all other things, high and lifted up. But the amazing thing is that Isaiah tells us the thing he sees. So he sees the Lord sort of sitting up there. And the thing that catches his attention in verse 1 is the train of his robe that filled the temple. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that he doesn't tell us about what, what the Lord looks like. He doesn't tell us about what the throne looks like or about what the sky looks like. No, all he does is this. He looks down. He's so overcome by the presence of God that he looks down and sees the hem of his robe flowing out throughout the entire temple. And of course, it's a picture of just this sheer authority and grandeur of God, isn't it? Isn't it true that the more special the bride, the more infamous, the more rich, the more famous, the more royal, the bigger the trail gets. And you see some of these wedding gowns which almost flow out the door as she walks in with 18 children carrying it behind them. And yet here, here is the Lord. He doesn't have anyone holding the hem of his robe because it fills the entire temple. You know, so it's a little bit like the elders of Israel when they approached Sinai. And God says to Moses, I'm going to show myself to the elders and to you and Aaron in Exodus 24. And he says to them, I will not withhold myself. I will not put my hand in front of their face as I show myself. And do you know what they record? The elders see a glassy thing underneath his feet. Because they're so overwhelmed by the presence of God that the sheer thought of lifting their eyes to look upon his face would bring terror. And so all they can do is just look at the glass beneath his feet. And all Isaiah can do is look at the, look at the robe flowing around him. But then something catches his attention and he lifts his eyes, not towards the Lord, but he lifts them up. And he sees figures around about the Lord. And they're seraphim. Now we could talk about what the seraphim are, but the reality is 
He doesn't tell us what they are. And the word for seraphim could mean fire. It could mean snake. It doesn't really matter what they are. The point is, they're a being that God has created for a very express purpose. And the only thing we're given is that they have six wings. You think, what do you need six wings for? It seems a bit overkill. With two, the wings fold in front of their face. And here is one of the most incredible things about this whole vision. You know, we talk about Isaiah being overwhelmed in the presence of God. And yet, here are sinless seraphim standing in the presence of God, and even they would not dare look upon the full glory of God. You know, and we sing, we sing, I want to look upon the face of God with such complete lack of understanding of what that even means. And this, these seraphim, they cover their faces because the brilliance of God is too bright even for them. The, the uncreated brilliance and splendor of the Lord is so incredible that perfect created beings would not even dare to pull their wings away and gaze upon Him. But they also, with two wings, cover their feet. Now, in commentaries, they argue back and forth what this is all about, and there's a vast array of different things. We're not told, but I think more than likely, in my opinion, the reason they cover their feet is that the feet, in Hebrew thought, is the idea of your own will your own desires, what you would move for. It's the thing that carries you towards your dreams, carries you towards your desires. And so by cover, covering their feet, they're effectively saying, I have no will. I do not exist for my own desires. I do not exist for my own will. And then the two flying wings fit so beautifully into that because the two flying wings show seraphim constantly ready to serve the Lord. At a moment's notice, to go and do what they've been beckoned to do. But not only does he see this, he hears something coming from their mouth. And Isaiah tells us in verse 3 that one calls to another, Holy but not just holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, we don't, we don't get this in English, but in the Hebrew, it's very interesting what it's got. It's got holy and then an intentional pause, holy, holy. And so it's almost like the angel goes, the seraphim goes, holy, and pauses and almost goes, that's not enough. Holy, holy is his holiness, is the type of thing the seraphim is doing. So as the seraphim have these wings covering their faces, the radiant splendor of God flows around them, and all they can do is just cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Revelation tells us in Revelation 4 that this goes on day and night. But, so at some point, they were created, and, and God put one of them there, and one of them went, holy, holy, holy. And the other one heard it and went, holy, holy, holy. And there was only one fitting response. Holy, holy, holy. And back and forth they have gone since they were created, just overwhelmed with the splendor of their king, with the splendor of their Lord. Just 
just crying out his magnificence, his wonder. And Isaiah, while trying, just even trying to take all of this in, notices that the entire place is shaking to its very foundations at just the voice of these seraphim as they cry out to the glory of God. As he stands near the door, he sees it shaking. Just imagine the, just the sheer terror of all of this for Isaiah. Being overwhelmed with the immensity of this vision, with the immensity of the holiness of God. But not only is it shaking, smoke is billowing forth. It's, it's, not a pres- it's not like there's just a bunch of smoke present there. But he says the smoke is pouring forth from God. So can you, can you imagine he's sitting there just overcome and the smoke is just flowing over him. Just smoke and smoke and smoke. This is not some pathetic smoke machine sitting in a church service. This is as Revelation describes it, the glory and power of God pouring forth in smoke. Brothers and sisters, this is a holy God. And when the Bible says, fear God, he he doesn't mean, you know, have a casual level of respect. He means be afraid. The word for fear, we soften and we say, oh, he means reverence. No, no, he means fear God. Because this is the type of God we are dealing with. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is able to do anything. Nothing thwarts his plans. And for Isaiah, there's, there's only one fitting response, isn't there? As he sits and is just overcome, there's only one thing that can come out of his mouth. It's not holy, holy, holy. It's just woe is me. For five chapters, he's been judged, passing the judgment of God upon others. In chapter five, he comes and he says, woe to those who join house to house. Woe to those who rise early. He would say, woe to those who draw iniquity. Woe to those who call evil good. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine. And then in chapter 6, he says, woe is me. Woe is Isaiah. Because he's confronted with the living God. You know, I said to you, true perspective gives true understanding. And as, as, long, as, as long as we look at other people, we'll think we're not as bad. We'll think we're not that shabby. We think we're pretty good. But what Isaiah found when he met true perspective, when he stood and saw the Lord... There was only one response, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, when Isaiah was confronted with God, he saw the true vileness of himself. You notice, Isaiah doesn't, he doesn't cry out for mercy. He doesn't try to climb the throne to grab the feet of God. He just cries out in despair and doesn't know what to do. And I don't know if you've experienced this, 
when you've seen yourself for who you are, when you've looked into the pit of your heart and seen the corruption that lies within it, whether you've been brought to your knees to cry out, what hope do I have? Why would I receive anything good from God? Why would I get anything? I deserve nothing. I am a man of unclean lips. And now the amazing thing about that statement is Isaiah was like a a gifted speaker. He was trained. He was an amazing writer, an amazing speaker. He was gifted by the Lord as a prophet. He wasn't a farmer who became a preacher. He was highly trained. And yet the thing he points to, he doesn't say, my my pride has caused me to be unclean. He says, my lips. You see, the very thing by which he would deliver the oracles of God, his lips, he declares, are unclean. You see, it's very easy for us to find the worst area of our life and say, I'm so unclean in this area. You know, if you struggle with anger with your children, it's easy to to admit, oh, yeah, I'm just really bad with anger with my kids. But Isaiah, when he's confronted with God, he finds the area that he is strongest in and says, woe is me for that. But praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. Isaiah's vision doesn't end at the end of verse 5, does it? You see, if his vision ended at the end of verse 5, we would have no hope and we would live life in despair. We would be like every other religion on the face of this globe which offers you no assurance, which offers you no hope. It would be like every atheist who lives in despair because they have no hope of what will happen. But we, brothers and sisters, have a God who provides us with verse 6 and 7. All of a sudden, as Isaiah is sitting in despair, one of the seraphim flies to him, holding in its hand a burning coal that he's taken with a set of tongs. And he rushes down to Isaiah and hits it on his lips. And says to him, Behold, this has touched your lips, and what? Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Do you imagine the words ringing in the ears of Isaiah? as he sat on the ground and the seraphim at the command of God said to him, you have no more guilt. You have no more sin. You are no longer unclean. Could you just imagine his heart exploding in joy and praise and gratitude to God? Has your heart experienced that? Has your heart experienced the joy of the grace and forgiveness of God? You see, because this is not just a picture for Isaiah, is it? You see, where does he take the coal from? He takes it from an altar. What was the altar a picture of? It was a picture of the places that sacrifices were offered to make atonement for sin. And you might say, but we don't have an altar. You're right, we don't. Because we don't need one, do we? Because we have a God who provided us with a burning coal. 
He took his own son and would sacrifice him upon the altar. So when the seraphim runs down to get this burning coal, he's taking from the riches of Jesus Christ that he has earned. And he takes that to Isaiah and says, your sin is forgiven. And how do we know that this is speaking about Jesus Christ? How do you know I'm not just imagining this? How do we know that this holy provision is available for us? Because John tells us so. In John chapter 12, John makes one of the most almost out-of-place comments. Speaking of Isaiah, he says in John 12, verse 27 onwards, he's interacting with the Son. Jesus is talking about how he's going to be sacrificed and lifted up. And the people don't believe him. And then we get to verse 36, halfway through it. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their hearts sorry, their eyes, and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. And then John makes a comment. He says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him being Jesus Christ. So, Somehow, some way, Isaiah sits in this vision, and as he sees the Lord, as he sees the Lord, he sees the glory of Jesus Christ, whether it be in the altar and in the sacrifices, or whether it's seeing Jesus Christ like the Son of Man in Ezekiel, high and lifted up. He sees the glory of Jesus, brothers and sisters. And God, out of that glory, out of that provision, brings forgiveness and atonement and the removal of guilt for Isaiah. And he does the same for you and the same for me. So that when we come to God and we believe we are not like the Jews who didn't believe in John 12, but we're like Isaiah who falls before God. And God, out of his love and mercy, though we do not ask, though we do not beg, though we do nothing, he comes to us in his Holy Spirit with a burning coal that is Jesus Christ, touches it upon our hearts, and our hearts are born again. And we receive life, and life in its fullest. And then we turn around and go, that was splendid. Isn't this world wonderful? You know, as you move on through Isaiah 6, what's the very first thing that happens? The voice of the Lord says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. Now, if you're worried, I'm going to tell you all to go to Myanmar. Don't worry. But there is only one response, isn't there, to the grace of God that is poured out for us, for the altar, for the sacrifice, for the goodness and mercy of God. And it's, here I am, Lord, send me. No more will I pursue this world. No more will I love this world and its idols more than you. I will passionately pursue you. I will passionately go wherever you call. I will love you and you alone. Because he is our God. 
and we are his people. Brothers and sisters, you've been bought at a price by a holy God. I call you this morning. Whether you're a believer or not, I call you this morning. Look upon the face of Jesus Christ. See true perspective and experience the grace of God. And you shall live indeed through the wonderful provision of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is utterly and completely full of your glory. And we praise you this morning, God. We praise you, our Father in heaven, for what you have done for us. Lord, I pray for any here this morning whose hearts are hardened, who've sat in church every day of their life thinking they're pretty good. Lord, would you give each and every one of us true perspective, but especially them. Lord, may we all see our utter emptiness before you and then see our incredible richness in Jesus Christ. Lord, would you exalt and glorify your name here and in our lives throughout this week that we may say with Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. Amen.